As long as I'm President of the United States, Iran will never be allowed to have a nuclear weapon. Tensions between China and the United States have been increasing over trade, coronavirus, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and now the South China Sea. It takes a few to make war, but it takes a village and a nation to build peace. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hi, I'm Rob Malley. Very happy today to have as my co-host, uh, Brittany Brown. She's uh, the chief of staff at Crisis Group, an Africa uh, expert, and uh, served on the, uh, in the Obama administration. Great to have you, Brittany. Happy to be here, Rob. And today what we're really going to be discussing with our guest is the what to expect of uh, a Biden administration and what to expect of his foreign policy, what to expect, what are the options for America in the world. And we'll have a great guest, Matt Duss, who is uh, Senator Bernie Sanders' foreign policy advisor. So he'll talk about that and about what a f- progressive foreign policy might look like. So looking forward to that conversation. But for now, Brittany, I wanted to ask you something. Uh, you know, Obviously, all eyes are still on the U.S. election. As I said, Vice President Biden, President-elect Biden, now we can call him. Now he won, but President Trump hasn't recognized that he lost. And he seems to be complicating the transition. You lived, we both lived through a number of transitions. Curious from your experience, the transition between President Obama and President Trump. How did it go? What are some of the things that you recall that you may see not happening this time? And sort of what are the, what are the warning signs uh, that we need to pay attention to? Yeah, so I was um, at the National Security Council in the White House with you, Rob, during the um, Obama to Trump transition. I think the, the big difference is that I stuck around for the first like eight months of the Trump administration um, in the African Affairs Directorate. And so I got to sort of see how all of the work that the Obama team did contributed to the first few months of the Trump administration. And what's so important, I think, about our system, about the way that we have this set up with this long transition is that we want to make sure that the team is ready on day one in case something happens, in case something comes up. So when, you know, when Ambassador Rice had everyone working hard to write transition papers and to get information ready and briefings ready for the Trump team, it was all in mind with they're going to need to take over on January 20th and they need to be ready to run. They need to be ready if there's a terrorist attack. They need to be ready if there's a coup in a country. They need to be ready because we have military forces all over the world. They just need to be overall ready for our national security. Um, I mean, I think the concern with right now is that we're not seeing that same sort of handover. We're not seeing the same sort of, this isn't about politics. This is about something bigger than politics. This is about the security of our country. And how do we hand over from one team to the next? I've been talking to a lot of foreigners who've been calling and sort of a bit scratching their heads about what's going on. The two peculiarities of the American system, which, which, come together, they come in tandem. One is, as you said, this long transition period. I mean, we're talking about two and a half months. I don't know how many countries that have our uh, similar system have that long of a transition. But secondly, and again, this is, is, is part of what makes it so, so complicated, is that so there are so many political appointees, I think 4,000. So there are 4,000 people who have to be replaced around January 20th. In most countries, at least Western countries where I've lived, there is a stronger tradition of a civil service. And yes, people change. Heads, heads roll and heads, you know, heads leave and heads come in. But it's not as wholesale a, a, a transformation of personnel. And that's why you need the time to get those people to know what the, to be familiar with the files, to be briefed on any classified information. In every transition, I've lived through two, one between Presidents Clinton and President Bush, the other between President Obama and President Trump. There's always politics, there's some hard feelings, it doesn't always go as smoothly as you want. But in general, it goes pretty smoothly. And this is really a case where, because President Trump has not conceded that he lost, he may never concede it, frankly. He is claiming that uh, President-elect Biden, uh, is, if, if he wins, it's uh, because of fraud. He has not given the go-ahead yet to his teams to work with the Biden transition teams. It may not be the end of the world, but it certainly could make a world more a more dangerous place in those initial days and weeks of a Biden administration. And who knows? I mean, maybe someday President Trump will have an epiphany and say, this is not the way I want to leave. Um, I'll leave it to our listeners to speculate as to what they think uh, President Trump will do. 
Rob, when you were around, did what happened when we were waiting for Florida and the hanging chads? I mean, did a transition team start just in case? So just for, for people who may not know, the hanging chads, or this is, this is, you're right, that this was the transition between President Clinton, President Bush. There were many weeks where the result was not known. It went up to the Supreme Court. Both sides uh, were, were litigating it. And so you're right that during that period, we were not in a position to share what we normally would share with a transition team because we didn't know what that transition team would be. So it was a shortened period. It began sometime, began sometime in December. So we lost, I think, about four to five, five weeks. Uh, but then at least we had that time. And at that point, we were told by then National Security Advisor uh, Sandy Berger, you know, be as transparent a- a- as you can be. It's kind of hard to imagine this team doing that at whatever point they decide that they are going to concede defeat. But again, let's let, let's hope that uh, there is some sense of comity and some sense of of, uh, of partnership. Because you're right that that was a shortened period, and you know I don't think that that's the reason why the U.S. wasn't as fully prepared as it might have been for the terrorist attacks that came from Al Qaeda, because that didn't take place until September. But it could have been. I mean, if it could have been, and so one could imagine things like that, a plots that are being prepared for right after a new president takes office, better for that president to be fully equipped to to cope with it. Well, and I think that the hope that we have is that the Electoral College has to vote um, December 14th or whatever it is. So we do have a date where the Trump administration will have to make a decision about if they're going to fully reject the results or once the Electoral College votes and it's a very clear um, victory for President-elect Biden, will, whether or not they'll, they'll play ball and they'll be good teammates. People who know us know you're always the optimist uh, between the two of us. I do think that ultimately you're right. This will end up okay. I think it's going to be harder. And there's, you know, we wrote a report about all of the things, all of the the, the tricks that the uh, Trump administration could try to pull off to try to you know, not have to leave the White House, at least delay it and complicate it and really try to tarnish the whole process by saying it was illegitimate so that, you know, if, if President Trump or one of his disciples wants to run in 2024, they can say, we're, we're restoring the legitimate occupant of the White House or the, the legitimate inheritor of the white, occupant of the White House. But meanwhile, and you know, we could spend you know, eight hours talking about uh, the U.S., but meanwhile, the, the world is not sitting still. And I mean, you know Ethiopia extremely well. There's a war there that's going from bad to worse. Well, and I think, Rob, I mean, the, the conflict in Ethiopia is something that, you know, as an Africa watcher, Everybody has feared for this for years. You know, Ethiopia is the second most populated country in Africa with, you know, 110 million people or more. And the idea of a civil war in Ethiopia is, I mean, I think it's terrifying to all of us who, who watch the Horn of Africa or just watch the, um, the continent in general. I mean, we're talking about a major humanitarian crisis. Uh, we're already seeing reports of you know, uh, refugees and folks heading over into Sudan to try and get away from the fighting. It's it's really pretty scary times, actually, in the Horn. Yeah. And we've covered it in, in a podcast recently. And I, I said at the time, just what you're saying now, when I was in Ethiopia about a year ago, I came out thinking this is either a country that's going to have a transition that will make, that could really strengthen the Horn of Africa, strengthen Ethiopia, or it could head towards a Yugoslavia-style implosion. Um, we're not there yet, uh, and there still is a lot that can be done to prevent things from really taking a an even more dangerous turn. But right now, everything that uh, our our analyst uh, has been fearing is seems to be coming to pass, including with the uh, potential of regional uh, intervention. And then the other place, and we've spoken about it as well, is Nagorno-Karabakh. As uh, as we're recording this, it's now Tuesday. The Russian Federation seems to have pulled off an end of the fighting. We'll have to see. But, you know, it's, it's a tragic loss of life and certainly for Armenians, uh, a very, very bitter taste of defeat. But we'll, I'm sure we'll have time to talk about it again. But it's clear in this case that Russia was able to influence. Turkey was able to show its influence. Not clear how much other countries, uh, the U.S. in particular, was involved or, or, or helpful in the end. I think as the as the optimists of the group, again, I think, you know, it doesn't seem like it's an ideal agreement, but there is some hope there that at least the fighting will stop. And I think at different points, we've we've talked on this podcast and some of the material that we've put out, um, it, it wasn't always a, there wasn't always a clear path of how we were going to end the conflict. And so um, I think I have a little bit of hope that maybe some of the fighting will stop. Well, I'm sure we'll come back to it. I think this is going to leave a lot of recrimination, a lot of resentment. And that's, you know, better to stop the fighting than to have it continue. But many people are going to have to learn lessons about why it came to this and, and, and why it ended this way. 
but that will be for another podcast. Yeah, and before we, we sign off, I was hoping a few weeks ago you had um, spoke about your colleague, um, Saeed Erekat, and um, sort of the impact he had had on your life and watching um, both at Crisis Group and in, in government about him as a mediator, as a negotiator. And I know that um, he passed away today, um, Tuesday. And so I was hoping you could maybe just reflect for a couple minutes for our listeners. Yeah, so Saab was a colleague, a friend, somebody I've known for over two decades now. He was the face of Israeli-Palestine negotiations with everything it accomplished and all its warts. But he was nobody more than Saab embodied that era and his passing symbolically coinciding with perhaps the passing of that whole era of Israeli-Palestinian peacemaking perhaps has in fact expired some some years ago. But it is uh, very telling that the man who embodied with great obstinacy and, and sometimes irritating obstinacy because he always was was fighting even when the fight seemed to have lost much much of its uh, meaning, but he never gave up. And I was talking to a number of us who knew him very well, we're talking about him today. And a point I'm thinking about is that everything about Saab that was irritating came from the same place as everything about him that was admirable, which was that sort of blind determination as a Palestinian patriot to move in the direction of, of, of negotiations and a two-state solution. As I said, he did it sometimes driving uh, Israelis, Americans, and Palestinians to despair because of his pretty uh, unique style. But again, it came from the, from the same place, the same heart that, that was dedicated to uh, a negotiated solution between Israelis and Palestinians. And it's, it, it's very sad to see him go. And now let's turn uh, to our guest, uh, Matt Dust, a foreign policy advisor to Senator Sanders to talk about the future of America's foreign policy. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. So, Brittany, now we're going to do something that may sound a bit premature. We're going to talk about the future of U.S. foreign policy under a, a President Biden. I say a bit premature because he hasn't conceded defeat yet, and he still has two months uh, as a lame duck president. And I think we know that two months in Trump time is it can be an eternity. But nonetheless, let's try to jump into the future and, and, and think about what a Biden foreign policy could mean for the world. And I really can't think of a better person to discuss this with us than Matt Duss, who is Senator Bernie Sanders foreign policy advisor. Matt, so good to have you on the on the podcast. Thanks, Rob. Great to be here with you both. And just a few words about Matt. He's a, he's a dear friend, somebody I really admire deeply. And I have to say, you know, there are many foreign policy advisors around town in, in Washington, but I can't think of, of any, perhaps uh, any other one, who has so profoundly shifted the debate or begun to shift the debate on foreign policy in the United States, almost, almost single-handedly. I think he had some help, but he really, uh, it really is something to watch um, to see how he has, by force of, of conviction, whether one agrees with, with, with you or not, Matt, uh, um, that you've managed by force of conviction. Well, you're saying everyone doesn't agree? Not everyone. I don't know. We'll find a few who don't. Wow. We're starting like this. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, my first question to you, which is, which is maybe a bit more personal, is um, you and I were on WhatsApp contact the night of the election. And at one point, I think you said to me that you were feeling a little bit nervous. But when you realized that Vice President Biden uh, had won, what, what thought crossed through your mind? Well, the thought that crossed through my mind was just ab absolute relief. You know, there's no, I mean, real just relief. You know, I mean, I, I think we were in contact. I can go back and look what we said, but I think there was a moment there, I think probably, you know, you know, nine, 10, yep. when there were still some questions, but I think as, as the return started to roll in and knowing that, you know, the late counted ballots over the next few days would, uh, would almost certainly kind of accrue m much more to Biden than to Trump, because, you know, Senator Sanders and I, and some of our team and others had done a lot of work, like looking into, you know, some of these post-election scenarios, then, then the relief set in. You know, and it did take some time to just be with that and experience that, as I think everyone should. But, you know, I think it, it also said in that this was a lot closer than I think a lot of us hoped. Um, I think Biden has one, uh, you know, an enormous victory himself. Um, I think it, it could be as much as six to seven million votes. But the way our political system is set up, he started at a disadvantage. I think we all know that. Yeah. But also just for it to be so close, uh, for Trump to get the support he did, for the Democrats to, to do, unfortunately, as poorly as they did in some of the congressional races, it was not like the, the fulsome repudiation of Trumpism 
that I had really hoped for. I wouldn't say I seriously expected it, but I thought that would have been um, a great way to start. But still, we are here. It was a really important victory. The Biden team deserves enormous credit for how they ran the campaign. So I would say where I'm at right now is just this was an important first step. We have a really important opportunity to address, you know, some of the the cleavages and conditions and, and, and issues in our own political system, in our own politics, in our own society, both in terms of foreign and domestic policy, to really prevent the rise of a future, uh, potentially more effective Donald Trump. Um, and, I, and I hope that's where we'll be focused. So, and, and as I said earlier, what I really admire in you is that you're an original thinker and you don't succumb to, to conventional wisdom, to, to say the least. And so you said it's a time to sort of rethink both on domestic and foreign. Let, let, to focus on the foreign policy, if you had to, in a nutshell, say what your diagnosis is of what went wrong what has been some of the mistakes of U.S. foreign policy and the mindset uh, beyond, from a nonpartisan Republican and Democrat, which, again, I think is where you've, you, you've made your mark? What, wh- how would you describe it? No, yeah, I will. I mean, first, let me just start. I mean, while I certainly appreciate and, and really flattered by, you know, the, the introduction you gave me, um, I do really want to recognize that, you know, I've been privileged to be a part of a whole coalition of thinkers, you among them, Rob. Um, NGOs, um, former administration officials, journalists, and others. So I think there really is, you know, I consider myself part of, of a movement. Um, and I do want to give credit to the people who I've worked with, who have helped me, who have talked through things, who have challenged my own thinking, continue to do so as we work together to try to, to advance this debate. Obviously, my boss, Senator Sanders, um, who, you know, I've had the enormous privilege of working with, has played an incredibly major role in having the courage to put these issues on the board and, and mount this critique. And I think it is a critique of, you know, American foreign policy, and to, but not only that, to offer an affirmative vision. So the way I put it, and I have, you know, I've, I've mentioned this a number of times, you and I have discussed it. Um, some of my friends make fun of me for how often I bring it up. But I, I think going back to um, the comment that, that Barack Obama made in the, in the 2008 primary, I think it was January 2008, it was a, a debate with, with, with a, uh, then Senator Clinton, where he said, I don't want to just end the Iraq war, I want to end the mindset that got us into the war in the first right. place. And the reason I keep bringing that up is I think that is probably the most concise and perfect encapsulation of the progressive foreign policy project. Um, and not just progressive, I think it is a, it's a transpartisan project. Just this idea that we, we, we've privileged or we've kind of overestimated the magical abilities of American military power and American power more broadly to create transformations around the world. Um, in a way that has been not only counterproductive, it's been disastrous. Um, and it's been disastrous for, for the Middle East region. It's been disastrous for other regions. It's been disastrous for us and our politics. Um, and I recently published a piece in Foreign Affairs making this case, you know, looking specifically at the war on terror, noting that obviously Donald Trump is, was, you know, mining the resentments and, and ideas and prejudices that go back for a very, very long time in American politics. But yet his movement grew grew much, much stronger um, within the discourse of the war on terror, the xenophobic, warmongering kind of triumphalist discourse that I think powers some of these um, policies. Um, And that's where I think we need to to look much closer and much more, much more critically. Now, obviously, uh, President Obama, his administration, of which you both were a part, I believe, did some enormously important things. Um, in kind of changing policies, drawing kind of draw the United States back within kind of international law and consensus. I think there were some decisions that could have been made differently, some things that could have been bolder. Um, But for, you know, for whatever reason, at the end of Obama's presidency, you did have this figure. And I think, you know, Donald Trump is an interesting figure in his own right, but he, it's important to see him as a consequence of a status quo, not as some kind of anomaly. And again, that is one of the, you know, I, I've said this before, is that I think one of the most dangerous ideas in our politics is this idea that Donald Trump is, you know, a break from the status quo, not a product of the status quo. And I think that is how I'm going to be looking at, at the project, you know, into the future, is how can we address some of these problems in, in, in the status quo that help give rise to a Donald Trump and not simply try and move past this and treat this, treat this as like, okay, we got over that, now we can back to normal because I think that would be a disaster. Matt, I was hoping you could expand a little bit more about how what this alternative looks like, like how the next administration would move forward with this alternative foreign policy, understanding exactly what you described, that we're in a world where, as Donald Trump as a symptom um, rather than the actual uh, issue, if you could talk a little bit more about how, how that foreign policy would look, what would the alternative be? 
Sure. I mean, well, first off, I think, you know, Democrats, progressives, and anyone who wants to see a less militaristic foreign policy needs to pay close attention to the way these foreign policy debates are carried out. Um, and, I, and I think I, I did take some encouragement from the way that, that Vice President Biden, you know, the kind of shift that I perceived on the way they talked about China early in the general, um, I think there was a much more, I would say, typical, you know, hawkish Democratic response on China to say that we're going to be tougher, we're going to be stronger than the Republicans. Donald Trump is, you know, kowtowing to the Chinese, as that really regrettable first ad put it. And I think that's exactly the wrong way to go about it. I think when you when you get into this kind of, you know, who can be more hawkish, um, that is a framing of the debate that inevitably privileges conservatives. It, ine it is designed to disadvantage Democrats and to advantage Republicans because they will inevitably double down and double down and keep raising the stakes. Um, you're never gonna win a, a battle of hawkishness with you know, nationalist conservatives. So I think, but I think if you look at the way their message shifted, I think it got much better. It's just to say, listen, China's a challenge, the way they dealt with um, the coronavirus. Um, there's very serious questions about what they did and did not tell the world. Um, they've endangered us. We need to address this. We obviously have a whole range of concerns with, with China's policies, whether it's um, in Xinjiang, whether it's with um, you know, technology theft, stuff like that. But we, you know, these, this is a challenge we can face, not only by virtue of our own power and influence, but by the virtue of our alliances and partnerships around the world. So I think, in, and I can get into more specifics here if you would like, but I think just generally it's you know, recognizing that America's relative share of power is declining, but we still have an enormous share of power. Um, but that power is multiplied with something that, you know, other, you know, competitors such as Russia and China, and they're often grouped together. But I think it is worth understanding, like, the Russia challenge and the China challenge are two very, very different challenges. But neither of them have anything like the network of alliances um, that we can call upon and the kind of, you know, consensus building capacity that the United States can draw upon to meet some of these uh, shared challenges. So I think that's where the focus would need to be. Now, as a piece of that, and this is something, you know, Senator Sanders has talked a lot about, but I also think this is a growing consensus uh, in the Democratic Party as well. You see Senator Warren has spoken about this, and I think uh, Vice President Biden in his foreign affairs uh, piece that he published last year, as we republished uh, just a few months ago, is addressing the idea of political corruption, um, not just abroad. I mean, this is not just a foreign policy challenge. This is a domestic challenge. Um, the, the idea of if the goal, as I believe it should be, and I think Vice President Biden has said it should be, I don't know if he uses these terms, but the way I talk about it is like reaccrediting democracy, reaccrediting accountable uh, government. We need to look to these issues of, of influence peddling um, and, and in, in ways that are going to be uncomfortable. You know, I think we, we've all looked at you know, we spent a lot of time talking about, you know, Russian influence in our politics, Russian meddling, Chinese influence, Iranian meddling. But I think we also need to understand that it's not just adversaries who find these avenues of influence in our politics. There are, you know, ostensible allies and partners, uh, some worse than others. But I think looking at the way that influence, you know, is, 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 is used and imposed on our political decision making. And now, obviously, like the opinions of other countries and other peoples and other countries, we should take those into account. That's just responsible foreign policy making. But I think taking having a much broader understanding um, of the of the challenge that corruption poses not only to our policy discussions, but to just the, the credibility and legitimacy of democracy here and around the world is extremely important. This is Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Today, we're talking with Matt Duss. So I want to unpack a little bit because, um, I mean, you've laid out sort of in, in broad strokes what an alternative could look like and what the themes would be. I'm sure you're aware of what the critique of this emerging progressive foreign policy is already. And, and I have to say, you know, the divisions within crisis group about what the role of, of, of the U.S. should be in the world. And just the other day, one of our analysts was warning against the emergence of what she called a new conventional wisdom in the U.S., which was we, could, we do far more... Uh, a harm than good when we get involved in foreign affairs. Uh, and therefore, we overlearned, I think I'm putting words in her mouth, we overlearned the lesson of Iraq, which was, uh, let's not get involved, whether it's in Syria or in Libya or elsewhere, um, because we ultimately have the capacity to do more harm than we have to do good. So there's that, 
that's emerging as a as and and I, I'm curious how you would react to the notion that people see in this progressive foreign policy retrenchment, internalization of U.S. weakness, as you said, relative decline in the share of power, and therefore less appetite to trying to help people around the world. Well, in some ways, I would agree with that critique. I think it's possible to overstate it. I think some people do for their own reasons. But I think it's not, you know, I think, let's put it this way. I think there is one part of, I think, the left and and the right, you know, the word isolationism gets thrown around, I think, often inaccurately, most often inaccurately. Um, But I think there are, there's definitely, and you know, there's a part of the American population that has a deep suspicion that just feels that it's it's too much trouble. We should just kind of look to our own affairs. I think there is, you know, and I and I write about this in the foreign affairs piece, especially as it relates to democracy promotion and human rights. I think there was a part of the reaction to Iraq, quite understandably, because of the way the democracy promotion was kind of used as like a Plan C justification. Uh, for the Iraq war by the Bush administration, right? First it was WMDs up, no WMDs up, Al-Qaeda, no, there was no Al-Qaeda connection. Oh, now we're there to build freedom and democracy and spread it across the region. Um, You know, we see this with Trump as well with his Iran and Venezuela policies, which are justified in terms of promoting democracy and the freedom of the Venezuelan and Iranian people, but it's just transparent BS. And it tends to, you know, discredit the idea of democracy promotion. And as a progressive, you know, I believe that we should, you know, use the tools that we can when it's possible to advance these ideas and advance these values. So yeah, I think there is a part of the reaction to Iraq, not just Iraq, but also going back many decades of American foreign policy, whether we're talking about Reagan and Latin America, where we often see these ideas used as justifications for, frankly, anti-democratic uh, policies. But I do think it's important to talk about okay, what tools and influence can the United States use to you know, promote human dignity, promote accountable government. So there definitely is um, a place for that. Now, I think, you know, staying on Iraq for a minute, I think that's a great example. Because I think, you know, Obama, the Obama administration is criticized for, you know, withdrawing troops and just getting out of Iraq. And, you know, we, you know, you you both know this, Rob, I know you know this very well. I mean, the, the details of how the Obama administration withdrew from Iraq based on a timetable that was set by the Bush administration, I think, is overstated by you know people who are trying to you know continue to defend the Bush administration's Iraq policy. But I do think there is a fair criticism that there should have been a greater political engagement, a greater humanitarian and diplomatic engagement within Iraq. And you know you may disagree. I'm actually curious, but I have the criticism that I've heard from some others, including Iraqis, is that staying invested um, and using America's influence to help continue to support and, and facilitate discussions and the building of um, democratic legitimacy and accountable government within Iraq and start, in, instead of saying, listen, Maliki's there, he's our guy, just let him govern. Because the way he turned out to govern was a very you know, Shia majoritarian uh, in, a, in a fashion that was really disempowered and disrespected, the, 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 the newly disempowered Sunni minority, which helped in turn give rise uh, to ISIS. So again, I think the issue here is not should the U.S. be involved. I think it should um, in some places more, in some places less. But what are the primary tools of that involvement? And I think that's where the real debate is happening. Yeah, and I think that's an interesting corrective. I want to ask you one more question on this, and then maybe we'll come to what you expect of a Biden administration, how you think it will uh, approach these issues. But one more question on some of what I hear. People have question marks about what this uh, alternative foreign policy might look like. And it comes it comes to the issue of restraint. And when I read what some of the restrainers, and a lot of their analysis I agree with, but part of what they say is that the U.S. should define its interests pretty narrowly in terms of you know fighting threats to its security, threat, threats to the homeland. And then there's some issues on which they inject a more human rights values perspective, Israel-Palestine being one of them. And I would think if I were um, you know looking at it critically, I'd say that's strange. I mean, you seem to think that the U.S. should have a very hyper-realistic policy almost across the board, except on a few issues that you care about deeply, like human rights in Saudi Arabia, human rights in Israel. Is that a contradiction you think that that progressives need to come to terms with? No, I I think it can be. I mean, I have certainly seen examples of this myself. I mean, you know, but, you know, at least for myself, and I think I speak for a lot of of my progressive colleagues, is that we, we simply want the United States to have a consistent set of principles and values promoted on human rights, whether we're talking about Saudi Arabia, whether we're talking about Iran. Um, I think in both of those cases, those relationships are obviously very different. 
um, the way we go about promoting these ideas with regard to Saudi Arabia and the way we promote them with Iran are going to look different uh, the way we promote Palestinian rights with regard to you know, our partner Israel is going to look different. And I think that's appropriate. I think that's just smart. But I do think it has to be based on a consistent set of principles and values, you know, so that adversaries and partners alike understand what the U.S. is actually trying to achieve. Because I think that is something that's been really missing is clarity mm -hmm. about what the United States actual goals are. You know, and that that's something that preceded Trump. And again, I think there's going to be some level of um, clarity can, can be tough to achieve. I think there is probably some level of hypocrisy that's going to continue to exist in, in foreign policy. And, and we should recognize that. But I think getting as close to consistency as possible is, is a goal we should have. One of the things that's sort of most interesting about this time is we're going from a president who we had no idea sort of what his foreign policy was actually going to be. He had never been in public office. So now we're, we're shifting to a president who has, you know, 40 plus years of a record on foreign policy, very active on foreign policy. What do what should we expect from a Biden presidency? Um, and what are some of the things, the signals or the signs that we should be looking for to see if he's going to adopt some of the progressive things that you've talked about? Well, I mean, first, I just have to say, as someone who actually grew up in New York, you know, during the 1980s and, and where, where Donald Trump was always, you know, he was always on page six. He was, I mean, <laughs> he had some, obviously someone who has a great estimation of his own brilliance and had talked about foreign policy for decades. And, you know, so in basic terms, it was always like, we're getting ripped off. They're ripping us off. We shouldn't let them rip off, rip us off. And it was interesting to see how that's pretty much what his foreign policy was. It's a very zero sum, you know, if they're winning, we're obviously losing. Um, and so I think that difference is, is key, is that Biden, and I think this is where Biden, and I think this is a, a, a genuine and a, a good part of the foreign policy consensus, and it's something I think shared by progressives, is that, you know, there is our engagement in the world in building multilateral institutions is a positive sum enterprise. We, so these institutions are frustrating. Obviously, engagement at the UN is frustrating. All these countries have a voice. Some countries you don't like, which pursue really bad policies on human rights, a number of other things. But everyone has a voice. There is a level of consensus building that, that goes on and, and can go on. So I think that part of it, just kind of restoring relationships, recognize the importance of longstanding relationships, particularly with regard to Europe, is something that Biden will clearly bring. I think Donald Trump, across a whole range of policies, showed that much of what was perceived to be a strong consensus is actually not very strong. And foreign policy is one of those areas where that I think that happened the most. But one of the things that's most interesting to me is, you know, when he went after Europe, when he went after Germany, when he questioned NATO. And again, some of his criticisms of NATO were shared with Obama and shared with previous presidents. But just the basic idea of, you know, the, the U.S.-Europe relationship, the transatlantic alliance is something that is sort of so core to so many of us who've worked in foreign policy um, as this kind of foundational relationship to our security concept, it, many of us were, were just unaware of how so many Americans, especially younger Americans, don't really think about it that way. I mean, they, they, they don't appreciate that. And the answer is not, you know, for us to kind of come down from the heights of Washington and, and explain to Americans um, why this is important. The, the thing is for us to go down and listen to how they are perceiving foreign policy and how it impacts um, their day-to-day -day lives, how they, you know, how they see the decisions that are made um, at the State Department, in the Pentagon, and in the White House, how they do and do not affect them, their children, and their futures. And this is something where I think Biden, and again, I think this is a consensus point in democratic foreign policy, but Biden has spoken to it, I think, very, very eloquently. It's just rooting what we are doing in foreign policy in this kind of, you know, in a way that builds and strengthens and engages with America's middle class. Um, I think we've, we've used this, you, you know, we've had this kind of talking point for a long, long time. You've got to be strong at home to be strong abroad. But I think Biden and his team have shown that this is not just a talking point. This is an existential question for America's ability to develop and execute a foreign policy that is durable and will outlast one presidency. And that's that's a tall order. But that is the project. So when, with all of that in mind, if we're listening to the American public, we're thinking about the last four years. Are there things that um, the next team needs to make sure to to hold on to from the Trump administration? Were there things that went well when, on the foreign policy side that we need to make sure that the next administration sees and continues? That it isn't just a rejection of everything Trump, 
but it's actually going in the right direction. Well, one thing I would say that's an easy call is, you know, stick with the, the commitment to end the forever war. I mean, there is a reason why Trump campaigned and declared, you know, great nations don't fight endless wars, why he posed as the peace candidate. He was not. But I think he was at least attuned enough to the, to the popular sentiment that he realized he needed to try and capture that, you know, reputation. Um, and I think it is very interesting. I mean, I know the Republicans didn't have an actual platform this year. They just had Donald Trump kind of, you know, dictating things to someone who was sitting near him. But one of those things was ending endless war, the Democratic platform, likewise, committing to end the forever war. I mean, this is people can criticize this as a slogan, but this is how politics is advanced. Just building a consensus around this idea that these large, these long, you know, these long term military interventions, you know, we're going to, you know, almost 20 years into America's longest war in Afghanistan, that we need to be drawing these interventions down. Now we can talk about the pace and, the, and, and, and you know, how, how fast we do this. We can talk about you know, in some of these places how long we might stay to continue to support local forces, but just the intent, the understanding and the intent um, to kind of end the global war on terror um, as such, I think is, is hugely important. Um, and I think you know, Biden should make good, um, you know, Donald Trump's recognition that this is where Americans are. This is where Americans want what Americans want. So I think that's that's really necessary to kind of reaccrediting um, American democracy and American foreign policy. It's an interesting point you make. Uh, you know, President Mike Biden likes to speak about the battle for the soul of America. In some ways, it could be a battle for the the vision of Biden foreign policy in the sense that. You could see two coalitions emerging. One is the one you're talking about, about some progressives, but also some people in the Republican Party, you know, Senator Sanders himself has reached across the aisle to some who also wanted to end endless wars. But then there's the the countervailing view, which are there some Democrats who think to the contrary that we need to be more, you know, continue the in the line of greater military engagement and greater US presence. And there's some on the Republican side, some of the never Trumpers who feel that as well. And I, I don't know what you think, but I could imagine that there'll be a bit of a tug of war between those two views in the, in the administration. No, I, I agree. But I think what's worth recognizing that for the first time, there is a lively and real debate around these issues. Um, I think we saw some of this, um, you know, in, in, you know, Barack Obama's campaign. I mean, he campaigned largely on opposition to the Iraq war. I think there was a moment there, you know, that was foreign policy was a part of that presidential election in a way I have ne haven't seen since. And I don't think I saw before um, perhaps 2004, but I think Obama as an opponent of, of, of the Iraq war and someone who was bringing a much bigger critique of American foreign policy. But I think the, the mistake I think a lot of progressives made was to kind of, okay, he's, he's in office now, let's kind of hang back and, and let him execute this. And, you know, with all due respect, I don't think we can do that this time. I think obviously we want to be supportive, progressives want to be supportive of what the Biden team is doing. I know they've got a lot on their plate, but I think one of the lessons learned uh, from 2008, 2009 was like, we need to continue to press this argument. We need to continue to build this coalition. We need to make, you know, the, make, make these, these arguments about, uh, you know, and describe what, how we want to see American foreign policy work, make sure that, you know, we're making clear that we, you know, these, these views are shared by a large constituency of Americans. And I think continue to, to press you know, the Biden team on the commitments they have already made. So I, I, you know, I, I want, I'm going to, you know, treating those commitments as very real. I believe they are real, but as, as you both know, executing them in terms of policy, once you get in office is its own kind of challenge. Um, so I think part of this will be supporting those efforts, but also, you know, pushing when we want them to move a little harder. Okay. So I was going to ask you the, this is a very typical Washington DC question, which is if you're in charge of the Biden foreign policy team, First 100 days, like what are your top three priorities? No, well, first, I think, you know, there are some of the, the steps that can be taken just with executive action, like rejoining the Paris Climate Accord. I think that, you know, I think there is a strong consensus in the party now that climate change is the biggest national security challenge we face. It's one that absolutely necessitates um, American global engagement and leadership and facilitating innovation and all kinds of things. And I think that is something like, on the back of that is something you can begin to restore American foreign policy credibility, just because it is so urgent. Now, obviously you're dealing with a Republican party that is anti-science, um, so you need to wage that debate too. So there will be you know, an enormously important political um, aspect of this to carry forward this debate domestically. Um, but I think 
the more you can do to kind of show that you're, you know, you're working with other countries and highlight those voices and show these examples of where climate change contributes to other problems that makes other problems and other conflicts even worse. So ultimately, this is something that we have to commit to. Um, the second thing is, um, you know, and something I and, and Rob have both worked on a lot is rejoining the JCPOA. I think, you know, that was a commitment that Vice President Biden made very early and very clearly. All the Democratic candidates did. I think there's a very, very important consensus within the Democratic Party right now in support of diplomacy with Iran. I think that is very notable. But the way that that rejoining and, and the kind of broader diplomacy with Iran is managed will have implications, I think, for I think their foreign policy across the board, the way that that debate is managed. In Washington, the way that the Biden administration is able to deal with a Congress, particularly one with a Senate that might still be in Republican hands. But make that case. The JCPOA is a strong nonproliferation agreement. Make that case boldly. Um, do, I, I don't want to see them kind of hedging and pulling back and getting drawn to this kind of like, well, you can have bipartisan support for just kind of putting a gloss on Trump's policy. I think that would be a disastrous mistake. Now, obviously, there are some valid concerns of where we are now. The sunsets are, I think, a legitimate issue because we are four years later. So I think there is some small tinkering that can be discussed. But I also think recognizing that the Iranians have a very valid complaint themselves. They've, they've endured very, very serious sanctions over the past four years, you know, after the U.S. withdrew from an agreement which they believe they were signing and, and our allies were, were, were signing alongside us with serious intention. So I think pushing forward boldly and firmly on rejoining the JCPOA and this broader negotiation with Iran, I think is going to be really, really important. I think we're coming to the end. I just want to leave uh, because it is something that I know I struggle with at, at Crisis Group, an organization I love. And part of why I love it is because they people always push back on some of the uh, assumptions that I have. And I think both of us, in a sense, have been scarred, if that's the word, by the uh, by witnessing how much harm the U.S. can and has done, whether it's in Vietnam, in Central America, uh, in in South Africa, in uh, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, and I think the challenge for the next foreign policy, whether it's you know for presidents like Biden and then whoever you know for for Democrats and 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 Republicans in the future, is how do you marry this feeling of understanding how much harm the U.S. can do to others and to itself with the necessity of of, of remaining engaged? Because as I constantly hear from people in my the staff in the field is what if there's another rwanda what if there's another syria what if there's another myanmar would the u.s simply say well you know we're going to hurt you more than we're going to help so we're going to stay home or will we find a better way of helping and and for me that's the challenge and i don't know what what thoughts you have on that and we could we could end on that note so go ahead yeah no i think those are all those are all the important questions and it's a and it's very difficult to just kind of say here's what we'll do in this hypothetical Right. But I but I think the way, you know, is but knowing, I mean, the best way that I, I, I can think of to kind of be ready for those situations is to have an, you know, a set of questions that you need to answer. You know, can we make a difference? Can we make possibly make things better rather than worse at an acceptable risk? Um, are we acting with, you know, multilateral support? Are we acting within the bounds of international humanitarian law? Are we acting with congressional authorization? Um, what a concept, you know, uh, congressional authorization for using military force. So, yeah, I mean, even that will not, um, you know, answer the entire question for you. But I think just having those questions at the ready, knowing at the very least you need to be able to answer these questions affirmatively um, to begin to grapple with the problem is important. Well, thanks, Matt. And, and I really do look forward to continuing to hearing your voice in the months and years, years to come. And thanks so much for having spent the time with us. Thank you, Rob. Great to be with you both. Thank you, Brittany. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Brittany, I don't know how you felt. I mean, I, I always find it very enlightening to speak to, to Matt. We are a nonpartisan organization. We need to work with all sides in the U.S., but he is one of those voices, one of those people who's trying to raise very legitimate questions about the direction of America's foreign policy. I know he is much more nuanced a thinker about this than some others are in the field. Yeah, it's really great to have someone who continues to sort of push the envelope about questioning all of the, the foreign policy uh, givens that everybody takes is just is just fact. He continues to push us to um, to ask harder. Yeah. So now I was hoping, Rob, if you could just remind us of all the fantastic publications that we put out this week. 
Yeah, so a heavy week uh, just because of all the events, but three things that I'd mention. A report on Central Mali's descent into communal violence, not much covered in the international press, but a but one of those conflicts that we need to follow. An alert about the clashes that we mentioned in, in Ethiopia, in the Tigray region, and our call for a ceasefire and for a inclusive national dialogue. And finally, a uh, Q&A on what's happening in Algeria. There was a referendum on the constitution that was marked by record low voting and what that says about uh, Algeria and its future. And that's it for this week. Thank you, Brittany. Thanks. It's been fun to be here to, to chat with you and the team. And uh, always remember, if you have any questions, to send them to media at crisisgroup.org. If you could leave a rating or review, please do it to iTunes or Apple Podcasts. And again, thank you to everyone on the Crisis Group team to put this podcast together week in, week out. Thanks again, and to all of you, have a good week. Hold Your Fire, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.